Well, hi, everybody, and welcome today to our 17th Inspiration Exchange session. And today's topic is on causal deep learning. Um, my name is Fergus Imri, and I'm going to be moderating today's session. And I'm a postdoc in the Van der Schaar lab. Um, if you've attended any of the previous sessions, you might already notice one key difference, um, and that is with me moderating. So I want to start by saying, following Nick's move to a new role, Tennyson, Liu, and I will be organizing the Inspiration Exchange sessions from now on together with Mihaela. And together with this change, we've decided to refresh the format of Inspiration Exchange and add new content to our sessions. First, we've decided to open up Inspiration Exchange beyond machine learning students to anybody interested in machine learning for healthcare, including industry, researchers, and students. And in addition, we're going to be introducing new content. And this is going to be that we'll now begin our sessions with mini tutorials on our chosen topic, and also include roundtable discussions featuring industry leaders in order to broaden our horizons and get another perspective on our chosen topics. As always, the ongoing aim of the Inspiration Exchange sessions is to share and explore the breadth of topics in machine learning for healthcare, as well as generate ideas for future research. However, as I previously mentioned, we feel these aims can be better achieved with a new format for our sessions. So to break down this format a little bit more, after my introduction, I'll be handing over to Mihaela, who will give a very short overview of causal deep learning, before our PhD student Zhao Ji Chen will give our first mini tutorial introducing some aspects of causality and their relationship to machine learning. After this, we will have two presentations from Joanna Bika and Alexis Velot, who will give presentations on cutting edge developments in causal deep learning. From there, we'll then move on to the biggest change of format, and that is our roundtable discussion. And we're delighted to be joined by three industry leaders who I'll, who I'll introduce more properly later on from a diverse range of companies, from tech to big pharma and to startups, in order to get their perspective on causal deep learning. After this, we'll open the discussion and invite everybody to ask questions of both our presenters and our panelists. As usual, please post your questions in the Inspiration Exchange Slack channel. And as always, the earlier is the better to allow us to make sure your question and there's enough time to answer your question. You can find the URL for the Slack channel in our previous email about Inspiration Exchange, and we'll also post it in the Zoom chat now. So without further ado, let me please hand over to Mihaela for her to introduce causal deep learning. Thank you very much, Fergus, and thank you everyone for joining us, um, and especially to our free industry leaders for making the time to, to, to be talking to us. I'm excited that today we are going to talk about causal deep learning, which is a very new concept that we would like to introduce today. We are, of course, very familiar in machine learning with the success of causality using structural equations. We know that, for instance, structural causal models allow clear specification of assumptions before estimating a causal effect and they provide estimation with theoretical guarantees, as well as natural interpretations for humans through graphical models. These are just some of the great properties of causal models. But there is a problem. It is generally impossible to uniquely identify the true causal graph from observational data without making some very strong assumptions. So what we would like to propose here in this causal deep learning uh, trust is to not be discouraged by this and, and by this need for strong assumptions and instead still capitalize on these powerful ideas from causality. It is true that actually doing causal inference will require heavy assumptions, but we can still leverage in causal deep learning some of its power and insights. So causal deep learning will focus on properties that are empirically verifiable. We are going to have a focus on practical problems and the overall goal will be to make deep learning more fair, robust and generalizable. How do we plan to do that? As I mentioned, causality has a very clear way to describe expert domain knowledge. 
And while the true causal graph may be unknown, in many scenarios, we may at least have some partial knowledge about this causal graph. An example is shown here. We may not know all the different factors that cause cancer, but we may know some of them. For instance, that smoking causes cancer. And even though we do not know these other factors, we can still use this information. So causal deep learning enables us to insert this partial knowledge into our machine learning models as inductive biases. So this will be one way, use deep learning to enable such partial knowledge. But we can even go one step further as you are going to see in some of the talks today. Even when no knowledge of the causal graphs exist, we can still assume that there exists an underlying causal structure and we can jointly learn and incorporate causal structure into our deep learning model and task. So today we are going to see several examples of this. We are going to start by a tutorial of Zhao Zhi, which will go in a lot more detail than I did about causal deep learning. And then we will see two incarnations of this work, one presented by Ioana Bika, uh, who is a current student in our lab, and one by Dr. Alexis Bello, who is a former PhD student in our lab, now at Columbia, and next month at DeepMind. Then we are very fortunate to have Sylvia, Kim, and Lindsay, which uh, Fergus will introduce um, later, which will join us to discuss this topic and understand um, its power as well as its limitations and think about potential future work. Also, I'd like to highlight that we are going to have a second session dedicated to this topic on May the 27th. And then we are going to look at a variety of other solutions that can be enabled by causal deep learning. And overall, if you'd like to read more about our current thinking on causal deep learning, I invite you to take a look at our research pillar on our website dedicated to this topic. Thank you. Um, I'll now pass over to one of our PhD students, Xiaoji, to give a tutorial providing a background and motivation for causal deep learning. Again, if you do have any questions for Xiaoji or Mihaela or anybody else, Please do post them into the Slack chat, and you don't have to wait until the Q&A session to do so. Jaji, if you're ready, please go ahead and share your screen. OK. Um, yeah. Um, thanks, thanks, everyone, again, for coming to this session. I'm the presenter, Zhao And uh, in this part of the presentation, I'll be briefly introducing the uh, background and motivation for causal deep learning. And this is not meant to be a comprehensive tutorial on causality. Uh, I would rather focus on uh, high-level ideas and motivations and what is the current state of the affair. And uh, as Mihaila mentioned, if you would like to know deeper about this area, we have, uh, uh, you can refer to the web, web page online uh, following this link. And with that, uh, I'll start with the presentation. And so causality is the study of cause and effect, and it has been a central topic in philosophy for many centuries. Over the years, many schools of thoughts have been developed to formalize and reason about cause and effects. And some prominent examples are structural causal models, potential outcome frameworks, and other frameworks exist such as uh, probabilistic causation, counterfactual theory, um, and so on. Uh, but in today's uh, work, we are going to focus on uh, the uh, structural causal models among other things, this framework formalizes causality in mathematical languages, which allows for quantitative causal modeling. And I also want to mention that uh, some of our discussions also apply to the potential outcome framework. So lying in the center of causality is the distinction between association, intervention, and the counterfactual. And this is nicely visualized in the ladder of causation, which is proposed by Pro. And lying on the lowest rung is the association, which captures the co-occurrence of events, statistical correlations, and dependency between variables. And although association lies on the lowest level, it is nevertheless extremely important. In fact, it has been the focus of traditional machine learning and statistics tasks, such as regression, classification, or feature selection, all operates in the level of association. 
Um, however, uh, association analysis might discover spurious correlations, which means that some variables may be correlated, but there is no causal uh, relationship between them. And in order to uncover this relationship, one needs to go one step further and start to think about intervention. And intervention essentially answers the question of if we perform some action or intervention now, what will be the consequence in the future? And traditionally, the focus has been on um, coming up with ways of quantifying uh, the exact effect of intervention with strong statistical guarantees. For instance, building, estimate, building unbiased estimators or coming up with hypothesis testing procedures that strictly control type one error and so on. And the method for solving this problem include experiment design and randomization. And one uh, prominent example is randomized controlled clinical trials, which is a, a gold standard for establishing treatment effect of drugs. Another possibility is to conduct observational studies on potentially uh, on data with potential confounding bias. This is a trickier analysis and it will be subject to stronger assumption. And on the top level is the counterfactual analysis which is the, uh, the ability to perform counterfactual analysis is a very highly regarded cognitive ability. And it is closely linked to retrospective analysis or imagining in prose work. Um, however, counterfactual analysis highly depends on the assumptions. And uh, this means that it is very hard to reach consensus between the uh, analysts. And furthermore, it is intrinsically difficult if it, if not impossible to validate um, the, the outcome of counterfactual analysis. Um, because these counterfactual outcomes are by definition not observable, um, so, so it disallows people to do, for example, model comparison in a very principled way. And so as we see um, here that association, um, intervention, counterfactuals are clearly separated on the ladder. And indeed, uh, from a theoretical perspective, there are completely different type of causal queries and answering them uh, would require a different set of assumptions. However, our crucial observation is that there exists a large space between association and intervention, and we'll refer to it as the wrong 1.5. And in fact, many interesting machine learning problems uh, of high practical importance lies in this area. Uh, examples include achieving better robustness against distribution shift or adversarial attack, uh, being able to generalize better across domains, transferring across different subpopulations, meta learning across different tasks, or few short learning with very limited training examples. Other areas like fairness and data augmentation also is related to this area. So operating in ROM 1.5 has two distinguishing features. One is that uh, we, we have the ability to perform, to perform empirically uh, verifiable uh, study. Uh, this means that, for instance, we could verify the uh, model's performance on out of distribution validation sets in order to measure the robustness. And this has the advantage of being able to quantitatively evaluate model performance. The other aspect is that we are often content with a good enough model that is useful for practical application rather than having to estimate the precise um, effect of an intervention, which is a stronger and much more challenging problem. And such shifts of focus would free our hand and, um, and make possible many different uh, applications. But before going that, uh, let's take a step back and uh, see how one could use tools in causality to solve analytical problems today. So when using these tools, the first question we would ask is that, do you know the correct DAG or the causal uh, directed executive graph? And if the answer is yes, then we are in luck. We can apply different tools in causal reasoning, such as dual operations, backdoor criteria to estimate the quantity of interest. Um, however, at times uh, we don't really have the causal graph known. And this means, for instance, some certain uh, causal relationship between variables are not known, or there are too many variables to, and the graph is simply too complicated to specify. And when this is the case, we have to answer some additional questions. Are we willing to make some additional assumptions about, for instance, causal sufficiency uh, or no hidden confounder? Do we want to make assumptions about uh, the 
functional form and noise distribution. And one common assumption is a linear and Gaussian noise model. And again, if the answer is yes, we can apply the existing tools in causal discovery to identify, to try to infer the causal graph from the data and go back to step one and apply causal reason. But again, these assumptions for causal discovery are often also strong assumptions. And furthermore, they are often te too technical for the stakeholder or practitioner to understand. Many of these assumptions are impossible to verify empir empirically. And last but not least, even if the causal discovery algorithm come up with a certain graph, uh, there are still remaining uncertainty in the graph and uh, some intrinsic identifiability is unavoidable. So which means that many practitioners are end up in a position where they cannot effectively use the tools and theories developing causality. But again, uh, we want to highlight that at times the problem at hand does not require estimating counterfactual or intervention in fact. What we care about is to having a more robust model that generalizes better. And this is, is essentially the motivation for causal deep learning. And we want to use tools and concepts from causality to inform deep learning. Examples include, uh, for instance, uh, using averaging the stability and modularity of causal mechanisms across different environments, or leveraging domain knowledge, which is which specifies or partially specifies causal graph potentially with uncertainty. And using these tools, we, are, we would be able to develop new loss functions, include new inductive biases, architectural design, um, developing better auxiliary tasks for self-supervision, and it also opens room for further theoretical analysis. And I also want to uh, highlight again that the focus is on uh, empirically verifiable task in the metrics, which enables uh, the method to be validated on real data instead of simulations, uh, which may or may not be representative of the real world scenario. And the quantitative model comparison would allow for iterative model development and refinement. And again, um, we can go beyond the one data set, the more traditional one data set, one task setting to focus on, uh, to, to start to look at multiple environments, multiple actions and multiple tasks. And with that, I, I think uh, many of you will be interested to know uh, the specific incarnations of causal deep learning. And I'll hand over to Fergus now, thank you. So we'll now move on to two presentations, and the first of which um, will be from Johanna Bika, and these two presentations will be on state-of-the-art methods in causal deep learning. So Johanna is a final year PhD student from our lab, and is going to talk about invariant causal imitation learning for generalizable policies. Again, if you have any questions for, for Jaji, Johanna, Mahela, or any of our speakers at any point during the session, please do post them in the Slack channel, and the earlier really is the better. Joanna, if you're ready, please go ahead and share your screen. Uh, can you hear me and can you see my, my screen? All looks perfect. All right. Uh, so hi, everyone. My name is Joanna Bika, and now I'll present our work on um, how to use causality to improve imitation learning. And this paper was done in collaboration with Dan Jarrett and Mihaela van der Schaar. So in this paper, we want to be able to learn an imitation policy in the batch setting that faithfully matches an expert's behavior, while at the same time is able to generalize to unseen environments. Now to motivate this, if we consider the healthcare setting, we may have access to expert data in terms of how doctors have treated patients from two different training environments. And being able to leverage such data in order to learn a behavior policy that would generalize and achieve expert performance in a new environment would represent a valuable way of providing clinical decision support. And this is especially in a new hospital region or patient demographic from which we don't have access to data during training. And here, one of the important challenges um, lies in the fact that um, the set of expert demonstrations that we may have access to may contain spurious correlations um, and selection bias. And if we directly learn an imitation policy from such data that um, learns these spurious correlations, such, such imitation policy will not be able to generalize well to unseen environments. So in this work, we want to leverage the shared latent structure between the environments. And this is motivated by the fact that, in general, the expert's actions are only causally affected by a subset of the observed variables or by a shared latent structure. 
So for instance, when imitating ideal driving behavior, the background scenery might change, but the actions will only depend on the car and road features. And by leveraging the expert trajectories from multiple environments, our aim is to uncover this shared latent structure that causally determines the expert actions, which allow us to eliminate the spurious associations and biases. Now, more formally here, we assume that the expert demonstrations contain information about observations and actions. And then we can assume that we can decompose these observations into a state representation ST that consists of the causal parents of the actions and a noise representation that encapsulates any spurious correlations with the action. And we propose invariant causal imitation learning, or ICL on short, which is a new imitation learning method that aims to learn these causal features affecting the expert actions and uses them to build um, an imitation policy that matches the expert's behavior and that generalizes across environments. Now we work in the standard Markov decision process setting where we consider a family of environments. And we assume that we have access to offline data set that consists of recorded trajectories from an expert policy in a set of training environments. And each trajectory here consists of environment specific observations, expert actions and next observations. And our goal here is to learn a policy that matches the expert behavior in all possible environments that share a certain structure for the observations and transition dynamics. So to be able to learn such a policy that generalizes well, we need to make some mild assumptions about how related these environments are. So first we assume that there is a shared latent structure underlying the observations from the different environments and that the expert's policy only depends on this shared latent structure. Secondly, to be able to learn this invariant state representation using the data from the multiple environments, and to be able to disentangle it from the noise representation, we assume that the data from the environment that we have is different, so that each training environment corresponds to an intervention on the noise variables. Finally, we also assume a temporal causal mechanism where the observations at time t um, can only affect the actions and observations at the next time step. Now, the goal of our um, invariant causal imitation learning method is to learn a representation of the state variables that is invariant across domains and an imitation policy that depends on this causal um, representation and that matches the expert's behavior. So by leveraging these expert demonstrations from the multiple environments, ICIL decomposes the observations into a shared invariant state representation ST as well as an environment specific noise representation. And this accommodates for dynamic mismatch between the different environments while also allowing us to learn an imitation policy by conditioning it on this invariant causal representation. So now let's see how this is done in more detail. So to learn this state representation that is invariant across domains, we use an adversarial loss where we maximize the entropy of a classifier that is trained to predict the environment from the shared state representation. Now, out of all of these representations that are invariant, we specifically seek one that also preserves um, the transition dynamics. So we also learn the transition dynamics for the state variables and the environment specific transition dynamics for the noise variables that allow us to reconstruct the next observation xt plus one for which we use the loss here. And then finally, to further encourage the state and noise representations to be independent, we also aim to um, minimize the mutual information between them. Now, using this causal representation S, we want to learn it, to use it to learn a generalizable policy in the strictly batch setting that matches the demonstrator's behavior. So we begin by first conditioning this poli the policy on this representation and minimizing the negative log likelihood of the expert actions. However, having only this objective um, corresponds to performing behavior cloning, which has well-known limitations in imitation learning. So to mitigate this compounding error from behavior cloning, we incentivize the imitation policy to stay within the distribution of the expert's observations by training it to minimize the energy of the next observation obtained by following the imitation policy given the current observation. Now, in terms of experiments, we first perform experiments on the open AI gym environment, where we can generate data from multiple environments by augmenting the feature space with noise variables, which are spuriously correlated with the expert's actions. And we compare ICIL against the standard methods for batch imitation learning. 
I also augment these benchmarks with using the invariance-based penalty from invariant risk minimization to understand whether such an approach could also be used to learn generalizable policies. And we noticed that our method consistently outperformed the benchmarks. And we also found that in general, uh, using the loss from invariant risk minimization does not help in this imitation learning setting. We also perform um, experiments on a healthcare data set from the MIMIC database here. Um, and here we consider trajectories of clinical measurements. And the aim is to learn a generalizable policies for the actions of putting the patients on the mechanical ventilator. And here we again have two training environments that consist of noise variables that are the same as the expert's actions with probability 0.1 and 0.2 during training and a test environment where these noise variables are the same as the expert's actions with probability 0.8. And in this setting, again, ICIL manages to learn a policy for putting the patients on the mechanical ventilator that best matches the expert actions on the test environment. Now to summarize, um, in this, um, in this paper, we propose ISIL, which is a method for learning generalizable imitation policies in the strictly bad setting. And ISIL leverages ideas from causality, and, um, and essentially it learns an invariant state representation that minimizes the presence of spurious correlations. And then by conditioning the imitation policies on the state representation, we obtain a policy that generalizes to environments with the same shared latent representation, but with different distributions for the noise um, that have the spurious correlations. So thank you for listening. So the second of our two presentations on state-of-the-art methods in causal deep learning will be from Alexis. So Alexis is a former PhD student in our lab, as Mahela mentioned, a current postdoc at Columbia, and will also shortly be joining Google DeepMind. And Alexis is going to talk about causally aware imputation via learning missing data mechanisms. Again, if you have any questions for Alexis or any of our other speakers today, please do post them in the Slack channel. I see some questions already, but it'd be great to have a few more. Alexis, if you're ready, please do go ahead and share your screen. So thank you for the, for the introduction, Fergus. So the, the topic of this presentation is uh, imputation. And imputation is the problem of uh, replacing missing data entries, which is a you know, common pre-processing step to use prior to any uh, machine learning problem, really. So you can think of imputation as a prediction problem, and it mostly is sort of about that way, where you try to infer missing entries based on uh, the data that you do have. However, depending on the underlying reasons for data to be missing in the first place, there can be a shift between the data that you have available and the data that you would have observed had the data been uh, complete. And this is where causality comes in. So if you like, in this presentation, uh, I'll develop an algorithm that tries to use these causal insights to do better imputation. And let me mention also that, that this is joint work with uh, Trent and Yao, which I believe by now are also former uh, PhD students of, uh, of Mihaela. And uh, all of us were, of course, advised by, by, by Mihaela. So let me give you a little bit of uh, intuition. Why would actually imputation be, be prone to, to bias? So I'll just introduce a little bit of uh, notation. And uh, specifically for each one of the observed variables, we'll include an additional variable R, which will indicate whether a specific entry is missing or not. So when R is equal to one, that would indicate that the variable uh, is missing in the data. And when it is not, you have R equal to zero. Right, so a common strategy would then, uh, you take all the data that is available and try to uh, learn a prediction function for the missing data. So in a sense, you're always implicitly conditioning on R being equal to zero, right? Because uh, you, you don't have access to the data you don't observe. And what I will argue is that the correctness or quality of, uh, of uh, this imputation strategy will depend on the type of missingness. And let me go into a little bit more detail by uh, just giving you a simple example. So what you, the graph that uh, you can see on the slides, you can think um, of as uh, encoding the functional dependencies between variables in the underlying structural causal model, okay? So here we have uh, two variables uh, recorded in the data, age and the smoking status of each individual. And occasionally we'll have missingness in smoking data, which 
uh, according to this graph, is going to be a function in whether a patient uh, or an individual smokes and the age of a patient. You can you could conjecture, for example, that uh, smoking individuals would be uh, more reluctant to disclose that information uh, when when you go collect data. And similarly, maybe younger patients will also be more reluctant to disclose um, any information, right? But for reasons different than whether they smoke or not. And in this example, agent smoking, there is no uh, direct a causal association between them. However, when uh, you use our prediction rule of our conditional expectation of uh, y given x to replace the missing values of smoking in our data, we're implicitly conditioning on uh, r being equal to zero. And this creates a dependence between uh, age and smoking that wouldn't otherwise be present if the data were complete in the first place, right? So, I mean, here the intuition would be, imagine, uh, you have an individual whose smoking data is missing. And you also know that he's a relatively young patient or a relatively young individual. Knowing this information makes him more likely to, uh, to not be smoking in the first place because you know that younger individuals have a propensity for, uh, for uh, emitting their, uh, their smoking data in the first place. Okay, so this introduces a correlation that wouldn't otherwise exist. And uh, therefore, uh, you can think of as uh, biasing what would be the true, uh, the true value of, uh, of smoking. And essentially, in causal language, you can think of as this information. So what would the smoking status be had uh, the full data been, been observed as, uh, by introducing this to operators? So instead of, um, so instead of just observing that uh, the data is missing, you force the data to be observed. And if you're familiar with this operation, so this fixing or forcing the data to be observed removes uh, the influence from causal parents into the missingness uh, indicator, right? And so working uh, in this model, you see that conditioning on R doesn't anymore create an association between X and Y, okay? So this target will in general be different from uh, the conditional expectation that you might otherwise be computing. However, notice that this picture, of course, depends on the underlying causal graph, right? If you, if you consider this alternative world where smoking is not association with missingness in, uh, in, in the data, then uh, conditioning on R wouldn't create a dependence and you could use your normal prediction rule to to do imputation. So Miracle is an algorithm that tries to use these insights to improve, uh, to improve imputation. So it's gonna go through two steps. It first uh, refines the imputations by iteratively learning these causal graph together with the missing, missing these indicators, and then regularizing the imputation such that the functions you learn are somewhat consistent with the causal graph. So you wanna be using the causal pairings to do prediction rather than these spurious associations. And on this figure, you can see a little bit the uh, performance uh, pattern that we would expect from this algorithm. You start with a baseline uh, imputation error. And as you refine the causal structure and you force uh, the imputation method to use causal parents, you'd expect uh, imputation to improve iteratively over uh, several training rounds. Okay, so this is. Uh, the idea or the target that we have. So where does deep learning come into the picture? It comes, the deep learning is essentially gonna be the, the tool. So it's um, premise of having uh, flexible uh, approximation functions together with uh, tunable regularization, uh, regularization losses that uh, you know, bias the function to behave as you would like is really what is, what is gonna be very useful to to learn, uh, to learn a function that agrees with, uh, with the causal graph of the underlying data. So this diagram is, is read from uh, left to right. So we start with an incomplete uh, data set, which we have the first uh, um, imputation round, which is then fed into our algorithm and uh, with a couple of interacting parts. So let me talk about the first one uh, quickly. So we'll make a distinction between the first layer of the neural network and uh, the following subsequent layers in the neural network. In the first layer of the neural network, which you can just think as a linear map, you take a vector, you transform it through a linear map and you 
you get another vector. So this matrix of parameters that does a transformation. For example, if in the first column, all of the entries are equal to zero, then you'd have no information going from the first variable to anything that comes after, right? And these patterns of zeros and non-zero values, you can think of it as, a, as an underlying adjacency matrix or an underlying graph of association in, uh, in, these, in this function that you're learning. So the first thing that we'll do is we'll try to bias this graph or try to bias learning of uh, these parameters such that you encourage the dependencies to agree with the underlying causal structure of the graph, okay? And here there's a little subtlety where um, you're not able to uniquely identify the causal graph. So we, we typically think of approximating a member of the equivalence class, but as a first approximation, you can think of this as being causally inspired and useful in practice. The second part will be more a number of additional layers that will really allow you to learn a complex approximation function. And its aim will be to reconstruct the data as well as possible. Now, I wanna give you a sense of the performance that you can expect from uh, this method. So here, there's a lot of things going on. So each uh, column, if you like, is a different uh, data set. And for each color, the lighter, the darker shade of the color is miracle, uh, Miracle's performance. And the lighter shade of uh, each one of these colors is the baseline imputation algorithm. And uh, the takeaway is that Miracle never, uh, never uh, deteriorates performance of a baseline imputation algorithm, but can perform uh, much, much better in certain data sets. So causal, causal information can be used and can be useful. So I went a little bit fast, but I, I hope that the key takeaways are clear from this presentation, which are number one, that the structure of the data generating mechanism is important for the quality of imputation, and that uh, differentiable function approximators and regularization, the hallmarks of deep learning, if you like, can be used to, to encourage uh, causal solutions. Thank you. So we'll now move on to the next section of today's session, which is our industry panel. And I'd like to now introduce our guests um, more properly. So our first guest is Kim Branson, who is Senior Vice President and Global Head of AI and ML at GSK. We're also joined by Sylvia Chiappa, who is a Senior Staff Research Scientist in Machine Learning at DeepMind and an Honorary Professor in the Computer Science Department at UCL. And finally, our third panelist is Lindsay Edwards, who's Chief Technology Officer and President of the Platform at Relation Therapeutics. The discussion with our panelists will be chaired by Mihaela. And if you have any questions for any of our panelists or any of the speakers today, please do continue to post them in the Inspiration Exchange Slack channel, and we'll open up the discussion after a few questions from Mihaela. So Mihaela, I'd like to pass over to you to ask the first question of our panelists. Yes, thank you so much. So in my first questions, I want to ask you, in which settings and applications do you think that causal deep learning will be especially useful? And are there specific settings or applications where a causal approach may provide benefits compared to standard deep learning approaches? And maybe I can start with you, Kim. Sure, well, I, I think, um... One of the interesting trends we're seeing right now in medicine is we're starting to have these large sort of observational cohorts. So it's a set of people that have a disease. We may have some, some hypothesis on people that may progress fast or slow, and we can measure a lot of things about these people, right? So I can take blood samples, I can measure single cell things, biopsies, imaging, you name it. And one of the things we like to, we need to understand is which are the changes, right, induced by the pathology of the disease process, so what we would call downstream of that, versus are upstream, right, that are leading to, that are the drivers of that pathological process. And this is something where it's a key causal problem and it also sort of has a mirroring to sort of sorts of things that we can do in the lab because we can build sort of cellular models of disease or these types of things and we can edit them with CRISPR and things like that. And we can sort of look at a time series of perturbation of changes that happen with that. And we need methods of actually trying to put those two data sets together right, to help you untangle that causal relation. So that's one area where I think it will have a huge impact because clearly we want to develop medicines against things that are, uh, you know, upstream, right, causal drivers of the disease rather than downstream. And the second thing we care about is what I will call sort of the, the clinical hysteresis, right? So 
if I change the expression or I build a medicine or something and it moves it by a small amount, what is the downstream effect on the disease pathogenesis? There's no point making a medicine against something that if I move it by 5%, like, you know, if I, if I build, make a medicine against it and I treat you, it only ch alters your disease risk or progression thing by 5%. I want something that a small change in the modulation leaves a large change in the effect. And that's sort of the second order thing. And that's where we're quite you know, deeply interested, as you might imagine, in, in a lot of different causal methods. Um, and particularly for us, it's all about time series data as well, because biology has a lot of sort of background heterogeneity and noise. And one of the ways we can kind of tease that out is having repeated longitudinal measurements. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, Sylvia, can I let you go next? Uh, yes, perhaps I'll offer a more general viewpoint, right? And this is uh, also keep in mind uh, uh, what we are doing at the mind is uh, to build these intelligent systems, right? So we think about deep learning is this very powerful machine learning uh, technique. So, and it is used normally in the standard machine learning paradigm, which is about um, understanding statistical relationship underlying data more than explicitly disentangling uh, causal versus uh, uh, statistical relationship. So uh, in some sense, like uh, it is prone to, to failure like the standard approach to deep learning uh, in all such settings, which uh, it does require to have a better understanding of uh, or a disentanglement between a statistical relationship versus a, a causal relationship, or it might be just useful to, to do that. So uh, this is a standard uh, uh, thinking about, right? This is not just about the deep learning, it's more about the way we think about machine learning. And that standard paradigm somehow is limited and need to be uh, accounting for uh, causal reasoning. So one way we could go then is uh, right, the, uh, trying to model and go into the causal modeling. And we have seen in the presentation and introduction that might be uh, difficult, but in some cases that is possible in, a, in the medical domain where causal questions are clear, we can go to this setting. And that is where um, we can see the power of combining the two techniques, perhaps uh, uh, like uh, using deep learning uh, as this very powerful machine learning technique for uh, causal discovery or for uh, really modeling this uh, causal relationship. And that's what they, or um, if that's not possible, then the question is how we can incorporate right, causal thinking in a more or less specific uh, way, depending on the knowledge we have. Um, so the question is, uh, and, and you have provided very interesting work uh, along this direction. And I think really, if you want to build truly intelligent system, which are able to do complex, uh, reasoning and are uh, really uh, uh, strong to changes in the environment. There is no other way. And this perhaps um, a viewpoint that data, collecting more data is enough. Uh, I, I don't think that's, uh, that's possible. So anything in terms of causal uh, thinking that we can incorporate, even at a very high level, some guidelines could be useful even for collecting data that, uh, uh, in a way that would be uh, preventing this uh, or enabling to learn better or preventing being uh, prone to a failure because distribution shifts. So this is a kind of uh, um, uh, general viewpoint rather than- Thank you so uh, much. No, no, that's fantastic, Silvia. Thank you. Lindsay, what, do you, what are your thoughts on this? Thanks, Michaela. Um, yeah, I mean, not surprisingly, I think Kim and I come at it, come at this in in similar ways because we're both in the drug discovery business. Um, I mean, it, one of the primary reasons that we fail, and fifty percent of the failures in, in in the clinic are due to the fact that the drugs that we spent all this money creating just don't work. And I think a reasonable guess as to why that is is because there's a lot of redundancy in biological systems complicated biological systems like humans so you know the more i learn about biology the more surprised i am that we don't fall over and die way more often than we do and i think that's probably because there's a lot of redundancy built in and and that kind of redundancy can only be disentangled with causal methods so um 
I think that's fundamental. I think one of the things that's holding us back, and I know you've talked about this a bit before, is is the issue that that the ability to sort of disambiguate things like Markov equivalence classes um, means you run into problems even with relatively small graphs. And uh, we're talking about very large graphs. Um, one way around that might be active learning. And I, I guess that was one thing I just wanted to ask you about as well was, was sort of causally motivated active learning where you're using your active loops to disambiguate things like DAGs as opposed to sort of more traditional things where you're sort of driven by uncertainty or, or you know, other types of sampling. So I would love to see some more research in that. The, the other thing I just picked out as well is um, we've sort of got addicted in the biological sciences to measuring everything on an arbitrary scale, because generally speaking, we're sort of interested in this thing being more than this thing in this experiment. Physical scientists are much better. They're sort of more rooted in units and you measure something in Manchester, it should be the same if you measure it in, in Cambridge. Um, but it does mean we have a lot of batch confounded data. And I think Joanna sort of, some of the stuff that Joanna was talking about sort of obliquely referred to this is, is there a way of taking advantage of the fact that things are batch confounded and, and using things like principle of independence of mechanism to see whether you can, because, you know, if those things are real physical mechanisms and they occur in multiple data sets, regardless of all the nasty biases that we've introduced experimentally, then there's very strong evidence that those things are truly causal. So um, I think, yeah, I think it's, I think, I think there's an awful lot of fun stuff to do very quickly. Sorry. But, the, the idea of kind of playing around on the rungs, I think, is really important as well, because kind of selecting where you need to be and what what assumptions you need to have can open the door to lots of different things. And I love this idea of kind of rung 1.5. And there's a lot of stuff to be done, sort of maybe rung 1.8. Like we care about interventions most of the time. Um, and so if we're able to, even without explicitly having a graph, if we can have some better handle on whether an intervention is going to do something or not, then I think in biology that gets us a lot of the way there. Thank maybe you. Uh, the what, I Lindsay? apologize. I will go to the next question because I know that two of you will have, but maybe some of it will come to the next one. Sorry, Kim, for that. So let's go to the next question, um, Fergus. So um, what area do you think causal deep learning might have significant impact and how do you envision causal deep learning being used in the real world? And maybe this is a question that I can address to you, Kim. I'm not going to address all the remaining questions to all the panelists, but maybe I can address this one to you, given the fact that you were jumping in. Yeah, yeah. I, and, and I think it, the question suits probably what you were planning to say. If I'm I, you, you're right, Nahela. I mean, just to build on Lindsay's comment, uh, a lot of what we want to do is think, think about sequential experiments, right? So to the point about Markov equivalence classes, you know, rather than thinking about, can, you know, can my method disambiguate these from a first principle, but rather can I design which is the optimal experiment to help me prune those classes, right? To falsify a large set of them and things like that. And that's actually a really interesting area because, you know, I would like to work out, I don't need to know the exact DAG or things like that, but if I have the ones that are most probable or the set that explain most of the data, because there's not really going to be one unique one, or how they sit in a hierarchy, because you can construct these things in a hierarchy of DAGs of detail, that's really important, because once you have that hierarchy, I can go and see what sources of evidence I can go and measure at cheaply as well. And so there's this lovely interplay between what you can measure Right, and what experiments you can do to falsify and, and at what level. And so we think about a lot of what I call systems medicine. I can measure, I can do lots of perturbations on a single cell level and I can get you lots of data on that. I can't do perturbations on people or populations unless I've got a medicine, right? Like that's the thing, but I can measure a lot about them as well. So thinking about how, okay, I can construct some various DAGs, I can put them in a hierarchy and which, which things about can I, can I measure that could falsify or say, yes, this one seems to actually have the effect. And what are those outcomes based on the perturbation, those linkages that we can do and how coupled they are, that's really important. So starting to think about methods that couple this to experimental design and feedback, oh, it's critical in medicine, but that, that problem is a general problem anywhere in industry, especially if you think also in terms of the cost, adding a cost function in one more, one more uh, you think on my wish list, which is how, you know, the cost of acquiring that data point and the, and the time for that as well, right? That's really, really important for us. So starting to think about that would be in incredibly useful. Thank you. A lot to, to think about for the community. Let me jump to the next question. So, um, are there any causal deep learning methods, including one developed by our organizations or yourself, which you have found interesting and useful? And I have this question for Sylvia. 
Um, oh yeah, maybe connected to what was just saying about this ranking of the graph that could be a recent work that we have done into, it is to use uh, deep learning, uh, particularly a transformer to do uh, causal discovery and in, learn a posterior distribution of a DAG uh, or a causal graph more generally given some data. Uh, so uh, that's uh, a kind of a, a new direction in the sense that uh, it is using a supervised approach in which you generate a lot of um, synthetic data and you train this transformer in a way that would generalize to some, some data uh, that the one you are interested in later and then will return a, a posterior distribution over, over graphs. And we have done also some other work in causal discovery uh, using more traditional approach of score-based method, but using deep learning to learn the conditional distributions. Uh, we've done also some work in fairness. So what, this is one area, for example, where I think causality is uh, absolutely essential and uh, you, you could easily- And if you allow me, Silvia, we will discuss it next time. We will oh, okay, the relationship. Then, uh, so uh, I yeah, hope yeah. you will join us for that. Sure, that uh, that will be extremely interesting. And in that work, we also leverage deep learning. In that case, it was more like uh, enabling uh, causal reasoning in a fairness setting and being able to model again distribution quite powerfully using deep learning approaches. Uh, there is some other work, but I uh, will stop here. Thank you. Um, the next question, Fergus, and the last question for our for Lindsay. <laughs> so, when there is only partial knowledge of the true causal graph, how do you envision using this knowledge in tandem with the data? And Lindsay, this question is for you. Um. I'm trying to think of the times when I've had a partial graph. Um, I, I, I guess uh, certainly I tend to find this a little. So you bit may more know some theory. factors, no, that may affect yeah, some yeah. others, but not the, all of them. Yeah, no, no, I, absolutely. But I, but it tends to come with a little bit more nuance than that. So we'll, we'll sort of there'll be things that we know. There'll be things that we might know. The things that we know sometimes turn out to be wrong. I mean, Kylie, you and I have talked about this a lot. Like ground truth in biology is remarkably slippery um so um yeah i think my question back would be sort of around how can we think about encoding priors as opposed to sort of leveraging a, a, a known graph i mean i know there's lots of real world examples where you can explicitly say well this thing definitely causes this thing and this thing you know and, and take advantage of that and probably in sort of slightly higher level things like clinical studies you might be able to do that a bit more um but in the kind of problems that i deal with on a day-to-day -day basis it's more of the case that um you know it's 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 a prior over your graph um as opposed to knowing some of it and not knowing the rest of it i know i sort of ducked the question there i'm really sorry that so you just have a giant <laughs> variable called called other stuff Lindsay, right effects and then other stuff as like your base yeah. graph yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. what's it all edges are we think we know and we don't know yeah it's, yeah the big latency <laughs> which is yeah. i guess most of most of science in, in yeah. this complex area of biotech and healthcare. Thank you so very much, uh, Sylvia, Kim, and Lindsay for joining us and for, for giving us new problems to be thinking about. Fergus, up to you again. Thanks, Mihaela, and, and thanks, Sylvia, Kim, and Lindsay. That was, that was, that was fantastic. I found, that, I found that thrilling for sure. Um, so we, I now want to open it up to a broader Q&A discussion. And we've had several questions um, in the Inspiration Exchange Slack. So um, I, will, I will call on you one by one. And if you could then unmute and ask your question, that would be fantastic. So the first question we have is from Ayush Bihana, Bihani, I think is how you pronounce that. Apologies um, if I get anyone's name pronounced incorrectly. I think you had a question to be yeah. taken by Shaji. If you want to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, so the question would be like, uh, do we see adversarial attack as a form of intervention? And if yes, how would we differentiate between a uh, counterfactual outcome and an adversarial outcome? 
Yeah, thank, I'll take that question. Thank, thanks for the question. And um, I think one differentiation is that the counterfactual uh, examples should also uh, follow kind of the causal, causal graph and the causal relationship, whereas the uh, adversarial example can be completely constructed artificially. And the adversarial example uh, does not need to correspond to any like real entity in the, in, in the world. And, and this is the, uh, one of the key difference between the two. Yeah. Thanks, Jaji. I think the second question is from Jason, also for Jaji. Jason, do you want to ask Jaji your question now? Yeah, sure. Definitely. I think I ask the two questions in general, I probably can uh, say, say them together. So first is regarding the identifiability. I've, I realize it's a very important concept in uh, causal literature. I think many of the proving efforts on that. So I wonder, like, uh, George, you can elaborate more on that, the, about the identifiability. Secondly, regarding the connection between uh, optimal transport and uh, uh, causal discovery. Yeah, thank you. So I can take your first question. Um, so identifiability, for, for instance, if you have two causal decks that can equally well uh, explain your data set, then by equally well, then, then there is essentially no way to distinguish uh, or prefer one graph uh, over another. And, and from, from this perspective, they are equally good or bad. And, and then you cannot identify them, um, identify the unique uh, kind of graph. And this is a common problem in inverse problem. Um, and uh, probably the, the problem is still post yeah, without further regularization or assumption. Thanks, Jiaoji. I think in the interest of time, Jason, we won't be able to take your second question because we do want to take questions from a couple of other people as well. Um, but if anyone does have more questions, please do join us next time to ask even more. So the next question I'd like to take is from Elizabeth Peramans. And I think this question is for Ioana. Uh, Elizabeth, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, that'd be fantastic. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I hope you can all hear me. So my question is, um, in the data sets that you used to validate your methods, uh, was it always the same clinician making decisions in different environments? Or um, were the clinicians sometimes different because this could also have um, an influence on the rules they follow maybe? So thank you for the question. So to explain like in our experiments, we create the different environments by augmenting the data sets that we have with spurious correlations such that we have control over these ground truth spurious correlations, and then we can test whether the method picks up on them when um, learning the imitation policy. But regarding your question in more general, like there can be different clinicians uh, taking, um, deciding whether to give um, treatment to the patient, but the method that we develop is based on the assumption that they use the same underlying causal structure and the same causal parents for making the action. And this is what the method is trying to address. But I do agree that it would be interesting to also look at the case where these decisions differ between different clinicians in different environments. All right, thanks. So now I think we'll move to the final question of our Q&A session, and that is from Omid. Um, Omid, I think if you want to ask your question, I think this one is for Alexis about Miracle. Uh, yeah. Quick question uh, about Miracle. I'm just wondering, uh, Miracle versus the other method is shown. Is that how much data is needed for each method and which would kind of work in a local version of this? So I'm I'm really sorry, but I'm going to ask you to ask your question again because I, I I couldn't I couldn't hear it. I couldn't uh, see the question the is in the chat, so maybe yeah, uh, Dennis and or Fergus can read it. Yeah, I think I can read it out because I think well, there's some internet issues there. So the question in the chat is, so with Miracle compared to the other methods shown, how much data is needed for each method and which method works best in a low data regime? That is, the, that is a good question. So, I mean, in a lower data regime, learning the causal graph uh, accurately or a member of its equivalence class is, is harder. I, I cannot give you right now exact uh, numbers. I mean, all of experiments, all methods use the uh, same amount of data. But um, 
But yeah, an interesting point, which uh, I'm afraid I cannot give you an exact answer right now because I, I don't remember the details. Thanks, Alexis. Um, so with that, I think I think we need to wrap up the session. But before we do, just a few housekeeping things from us. So the first is we're still recruiting for PhD positions starting in uh, later in 2022. Obviously, there's, there's, we're not recruiting for very much longer. So if you are considering this, please do please do, do so as, as soon as possible. And in order to do this, please do visit our website, click on the Join Us button, and then fill out this short form. The last bit of housekeeping is about our next session. So our next session will take place on the 27th of May and will be a part two on causal deep learning, where we'll go a bit deeper into some of the topics discussed and, and introduce you to new methods addressed at new problems. And in the meantime, um, I want to say, if you do want to stay up to date with Inspiration Exchange, do visit our dedicated webpage for these sessions. And please let your friends and colleagues know about these sessions. And in particular, um, now that we've opened these sessions up to a broader range of participants, and introduce a new format, it would be great to see some new faces here. And finally, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's joined the session and a huge thank you to all of our speakers and panelists today. And I look forward to seeing everyone at our next session. Thank you.